Welcome to Healthy Heart. Uh, this is Dr. Isaac Opokwasari. Thank you for joining me this evening uh, for another time uh, uh, for us to discuss things pertaining to cardiovascular health. I hope that this program that we've been doing has been helping you and I believe that um, even as you apply some of these principles in consultation with anything that you hear from your doctor, um, it's going to help you not only to live long but also to enjoy the life that we have. Today we're going to talk about something called CAD, CAD, right? When you go to your doctor, your doctor will say, okay, this person has a history of CAD. What does CAD stand for? It's one of the most popular terminologies you're going to hear in cardiology. And what does it stand for? CAD stands for coronary artery disease. And, uh, uh, and what is that? So, uh, um, coronary artery disease, let's put it this way, is essentially the formation of plaques in the blood vessels that are going to the heart to supply blood to the heart, to supply the oxygen to the heart muscles, to supply the nutrients that you eat to the, to the, uh, uh, to the heart muscles. And, and if you have coronary artery disease, it essentially means that you have these plaque build up in the blood vessels and it is important to separate this from a clot a clot is not the same as a plaque all people always uh, associate that that whenever we say that if somebody has got a blockage they think that a person has got a clot in the blood vessels no clots are usually a formation of blood coming together and then uh, uh, you form a thrombus that's what we'll say but the formation of plaque is not like that. People get close and close, they develop pretty quick most of the time. But coronary artery disease is not something that you develop in a day. It's actually the food and all the things that we do and genetics in addition to it is also a part of it. We gave this lecture some time ago last or last year, but today we're giving it in a totally refined, uh, in a totally different form to open your eyes to certain concepts here. So if you look at the diagram that we have about coronary artery disease, you see a plaque formation. You see the plaque is, is, uh, is the yellow part, and that is a cholesterol. Uh, but it's not only made up of cholesterol. Uh, um, it's a very important point. It's made up of cholesterol. It's made up of calcium. It's made up of uh, a lot of um, uh, microphages, things that potentially can cause it to rupture. And once it ruptures, then you can form a clot on top of it. And that is what causes people to have a heart attack. I'm going to make a distinction between coronary artery disease and heart attack. They are not the same. A lot of people in this country have coronary artery disease. Many, 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 many people. But it doesn't mean that you have heart attack. And we're going to make that distinction. So let us look at this. And it's very important. So you see that there's a plaque formation, that yellow thing in people. And it starts very early. You realize that in America now, these pictures are probably a little bit, uh, I don't know whether they are, Probably, uh, uh, um, I'm hoping that they are as contemporary as we w want them to be. But realize that at the age of 10 years, probably a lot of people do not have it. I'm not sure whether that is true now. In the, in the light of the way we eat, right? The cholesterol, uh, um, the, 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 uh, the, uh, uh, the sugars that we consume, all these things. And I've told you that it is not just a matter of eating fat. But even if you eat excess calories, it can be converted into that. And, uh, and there may be genetic factors. So the, I'm not going to go into the mechanism. But the first thing is that you realize that by the age of 20, people already have started forming plaques in their blood vessels. Actually, it was found in army recruits. Even army recruits, very healthy, the best of the best. They saw that at a very young age, at the age of 20, you see the plaque formation which we call them fatty streaks at this stage. 
And by the age of 30, you realize that the plaque is beginning to what? Build up. And by the age of 40, you have significant amount of plaque that is sitting there. And by the age of 50, a significant part of the population have some amount of plaque in their coronaries. And, and this does not relate to symptoms, does not, does not necessarily mean that you're going to have symptoms or not. And the fact that you have symptoms does not, the fact that you don't have symptoms does not mean that you don't have what? A plaque in the blood vessels that you have. Because as you look at there, when you are at the age of 30, it is only about what? It may be about only 20% blockage. So there's a lot of blood that can flow, right? When you get to the age of 40, it may be about 30 to 40 percent so a lot of blood can flow and when you get to the age of 50 now we're talking about what more blockage and it may be 50 percent blocked why is that because if this continues and you get to generally around 70 percent blockage then the supply of blood to the the supply of blood for its nutrients and other things to the muscle is what is significantly reduced and that can lead to problems like what like uh, 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 people can end up with heart attacks people can end up with uh, um, heart failure this is the same mechanism that also occurs in people who have stroke and who, who and people who have pain in their legs because of plaque formation so this is the reason why we did a discussion on cholesterol we did a discussion on sugars and all those things because this is what it does and let me explain the principle to you this is the reason why we said that any man that is more than 45 years old a man that is 45 years old and that man is complaining of chest pain or shortness of breath or something like that this is why cardiologists get very worried about the possibility of you having blockage in the heart because as you look at the numbers here, by the time that you get to 40 years as a man, you are already what having probably around our more than probably 40 to 50 percent blockage in your heart, and that is why this is important. So any man that is 45 is important. In women, estrogen is supposed to give a little bit of a protective effect. So in women, it is known that around the age of 55. That is where most women begin to have heart attacks. And it is based on the fact that at that point there is a withdrawal of the estrogen. And that is why people get it. Not only that. So not only that it causes, it reduces the blood supply. Sometimes with the, with the plaque formation, it can cause the blood vessels to balloon out. And the blood vessels, especially the big blood vessels in your aorta. We're going to talk about that. That is very important. We'll call it a... Um, um, uh, triple A. It can cause it to what? To balloon out. That is why it says over here, aneurysm and rupture. It balloons out and ruptures. I know of when I was, uh, when I was, uh, uh, when I was in my medical school, one of the uh, professors over there, he had this uh, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm and uh, he was a chain smoker. Uh, he ended up with uh, a rupture and he died. He died. And uh, when you rupture, you die very, very fast. We count the death in minutes not in uh we count it in hours not in about days so this is a fatal fatal condition that um that uh uh, uh if it ruptures that is a, that is a, that is a surgical emergency and that needs to be taken care of so the three things that it ultimately leads to one i've talked about ballooning out of rupture in terms of the triple a but that is not coronary disease it's, it's, it's a part of it the other thing is that it can be like 90 percent anything above 70 percent it's a problem and that begins to reduce the blood supply to the place and then one of the things that happens and i'm going to talk about this because uh down the road here is that ultimately sometimes you see the plaque you see it's that the plaque is yellow you also look at when you're more than 50 years you're going to see this principle the plaque is about uh, uh um 50 percent or let's say you are 40 percent um and and i've been having a lot of yeah, young men uh, and young women when i say young is 40 year olds i've been seeing a lot of 40 year 45 40 something year olds coming with heart attacks which is which is a, and these people never had any problem in terms of a heart attack and this is why it happens because you see when you are 40 percent all of a sudden 
you can the, the top of it can rupture and when the top of it ruptures then that is what causes some people to, to have a heart attack so you may have blockage in the blood vessels but you don't have a heart attack now because it has not ruptured the top of the plaque has not ruptured when the top of the plaque ruptures all of a sudden people can get chest pain the blood vessel is blocked and that can lead to serious consequences so let us look at the uh, we'll come back to this picture let us look at the uh, uh, the prevalence how many people have got this so let me give you this perspective a lot of people around the world several people around the world have coronary artery disease which is plaque formation and blockage of the blood vessels ultimately blockage of the blood vessels go into the heart i repeat it is not a clot and it is much more common in women compared to men you know what we are showing you is one diagram that can give you all the ideas but all the, almost all the ideas about coronary artery uh, coronary artery disease essentially is Essentially, it is atherosclerosis in the heart, but it can occur in the blood vessel that goes to the brain to give people stroke. In the heart, it gives heart attack. In the leg, it can it can uh, cause blockages and and then loosen the legs. So these are the things that you see. I don't believe in the when you see the diagram. Don't believe in the vitamin B deficiency. It has been proven that that is not one of the causes of it. So we're going to look at um, we're going to come back to this diagram. And then look at it. You also see in the diagram over here. Don't look at the chlamydia. Chlamydia has been shown not to be that. So we're going to go through all these stages and then talk about it to be able to help you. So what are the what are the challenges of a, 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 a coronary artery disease? What are the um, what are the factors that causes people to have coronary artery disease? Number one, probably the biggest. Is genetics. If somebody in your family ended up having or being told that he has a blockage in the heart less than the age of 50, then is evidence from the medical standpoint, I'm not talking as a pastor, from the medical standpoint, that you have a genetic predisposition to have a blockage in your heart. The challenge for certain people in, 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 in developed countries where people sometimes, sometimes people do not live long is that because coronary artery disease is, an, is, is a disease of 40 years and plus, people do not know their whole history that they have this condition. And because of that, the, you do not know your family history well, whether you've got a blockage in the heart or not. So, number one is knowing your family history and knowing the world, right? Uh, and and um, I always tell people, pastors will call it demons, doctors will call it genetic factors. But whatever it is, do something about it, right? And we are going to talk about how these things affect us why is that important because as you go through these risk factors you will know that these risk factors that what causes people to have a blockage a lot of people think that oh it's all cholesterol no it's not it's not cholesterol it's not just cholesterol what you see there is a very simplistic uh, uh, graphic uh, uh, presentation of uh, of uh, of coronary artery disease because when you look at the picture and it's yellow you think it's all the fat absolute fat plays a critical role it is probably after genetics the second thing is high cholesterol your cholesterol must be controlled i cannot really emphasize that that is why that picture is yellow because it's a pack of fat out there and it not necessarily just come from eating fat food if you eat too much sugars and you end up with what you end up with the diabetes will end up with uncontrolled what uh, 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 um um, um, blood sugars, uncontrolled hypertension, uncontrolled uh, 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 um, triglycerides, and all those things, that will contribute to you having it. So, what are the risk factors? I said number one is genetics. Number two, it is cholesterol. Cholesterol, cholesterol. Especially your LDL. 
The LDL is considered the bad cholesterol. And if your LDL is high, you can we, we, we did a discussion on that, and you can you can go there and, and, and uh, uh, go to our, our website, and uh, you can you'll be able to get that information. Your LDL, if your LDL is high, then that predisposes you to have coronary artery disease. Even if you have symptoms or not, it doesn't matter. And that is why we believe that anybody that is above 40 years, based on your age and your characteristics, then you need to be able to ensure that your LDL is low. Let's go to number three, high blood pressure. High blood pressure, why does high blood pressure? Because we believe that the reason why the cholesterol is able to enter the blood vessel is because high blood pressure can affect the integrity of the lining of the, the inner lining of the blood vessel, sort of opening it up or making it vulnerable for the bad cholesterol to enter and start building it up. And that is why high blood pressure is a problem and it's important that you control your blood pressure, ideally getting your blood pressure under 130 over 80. Or minimum, I say 140 over 80. Getting the blood pressure low is important. Let us go to other factors. So, uh, smoking. Smoking, smoking, smoking. Smoking, and in my opinion, is probably the worst thing that you can do for your health. It has absolutely no benefit. At least if you eat food, and at least you get some good taste in your mouth and feel good, ah, and things happen. But there is, there is no benefit of smoking at all. And sometimes people don't smoke, but their husband smoke or their friends smoke. If your friend is smoking and you're standing there, you are smoking. There is no difference between the, the, the secondhand smoker and the first person that is smoking. So whether you are, I mean, you are the person that smokes or you are exposing yourself to smoking, smoking causes once again a uh, 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 significant ability for the for the bad cholesterol to enter the blood vessels and start the plaque buildup. And this is how this mechanism works. Once one bad cholesterol gets inside to start it, it allows more of them. It's like it opened the door for more of them to come in over there. And the later on, we'll talk about how we treated this condition. So we've talked about genetics. We've talked about uh, uh, um, cholesterol. We'll talk about hypertension, we'll talk about smoking, we'll talk about diabetes, an uncontrolled what, blood sugar. And essentially what I'm talking about generally is hemoglobin A1C of 7, right, or above. These are the numbers uh, that we look at. I mean, there is no data, there is not a lot of data to support that if you are below 7, there is any, there is any benefit. But definitely above 7 is something that you need to be able to take care of it and be able to control it. Getting the blood sugars down is critical and important to be able to help you to do the things that you want to do. It's very, very, very important uh, 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 in many, many, many ways because once the, 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 the blood sugars are up, your triglyceride is going to go up, the LDL is going to go up. And that is why it is important that um, uh, you bring the blood sugar, especially the hemoglobin A1C, keep it below 7. If you can do that, that will go a very, very long way. That is a whole discussion by itself. But we're going to look at the things. There are certain things that if you do them, it is going to go a long way to help you. So what are the other things that have been known? Now we know that HIV, people that have HIV, I've, I've been seeing this a lot recently. I don't know why, whether there is any relationship with, with the COVID or not. But um, um, uh, HIV is also one of the factors that uh, 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 predisposes people to, to, to have a, a coronary artery disease. And um, the interesting thing that I've found in most people that I have, I've, I've seen with coronary artery disease in HIV patients is that most of them present the first time that they will know that they have coronary artery disease it will be a heart attack. That means that they had a rupture of the plaque and all of a sudden the blood vessel closes. And I generally tend to see them much, much, a little bit younger, not much, but a little younger than the average population. And I've seen them within the ages of 40s to their 50s, where they present with heart attacks. Young men and young women in the prime of their lives being hit with this um, very, very bad uh, situation of heart attacks. So 
So HIV is one of them. The other one, other factor that we also need to know is people with uh, rheumatoid arthritis. It is now known that people with rheumatoid arthritis are also predisposed to have coronary artery disease. Another condition that we know that predisposes people to coronary artery disease is people with kidney problems. Right? Reduced kidney function can also predispose people to having coronary artery disease. So that is a very important point. We know that people with psoriasis probably also have a risk for coronary artery disease. The other thing that comes to women in particular, that is specific for women with coronary artery disease, is a condition we call preeclampsia. When women are pregnant, they will have high blood pressure, a lot of proteins. If you are a woman that have got a, a, had a history of preeclampsia, it is important to know, this is something that came out not too long ago, that having a preeclampsia or a history of preeclampsia predisposes you to have coronary artery disease. And, and the point here is not just a heart attack, but I'm talking about a plaque build up in your blood vessels that is going to the heart which if you don't take care of it will ultimately lead to problems down the road and that is why it is important for you to be able to take care of that so let us go over the risk factors again i'm going over them so that you will see yourself in the appropriate picture once again the genetics second is what cholesterol three is diabetes at a point in time we felt diabetes was like the ultimate but now we know that it's all of them put together so, so genetics, uh, cholesterol, high blood pressure, smoking, uh, uh, um, HIV, kidney, uh, reduced kidney function, um, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, and preeclampsia, and, uh, and smoking. All these are the factors. And if you have some of these factors, it is important to take the steps. If you take the steps, it is going to help you. We know that these things work. And that is very important. So let us talk about, uh, let us have talk about the risk factors. Let us talk about prevention. How do you prevent this? How do you prevent coronary artery disease? Prevention, they say an answer of prevention is better than what? Cure. And in my opinion, that is what uh, um, I have found that if you do those things, I tell a lot of people, even if you are taking medications, you reduce the number of medications you take. So it's simple. The reason why we talk about the risk factors first is because they come from the risk factors. What do you need to do? You need to what? You need to you need to control your weight. It's important. I have lost. I've told you that I have lost about uh, sixty pounds uh, for for uh, for for some time now, and I've lived with it, and I've I've been able to maintain the weight because you have to develop a lifestyle that is around it. Exercise. It's not enough just to just say I do a lot of hard work. I know a lot of people that are type A's. They do a very a lot of hard work. Whilst they are their work, they get heart attack. The reason why they think that is that they thought that by going up and down, running around, that is enough. It's not. I'm repeating that. You need what we call leisure time physical activity. That means that you set time aside to exercise. And that is something that I stress to everybody that I meet as much as possible. I stress it to my family. I tell my children all the time that a legacy, if I can leave you with a legacy of exercise, that is probably one of the greatest things that parents can give to their children because of the fact that sometimes we don't see the benefits of that. So avoidance of smoking, we've talked about it. So the seven pillars of ID cardiovascular health is what you need. But exercise is important. Controlling your weight is important. We'll talk about appropriate dietary patterns. You can find that on our website. All that information is there and, uh, and uh, you can pick them up. It's very, very important to, for you to be able to do that. Controlling your weight. You see, the pillars of ID cardiovascular health is what? It's physical activity, appropriate dietary patterns, weight what? Weight management and what? Avoidance of smoking. These are the four pillars. If you can do these four things, then that would help what? control the high blood pressure. That will help control the diabetes. That will help control uh, um, 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 the cholesterol. That will go a very long way to be able to help you. Let us move on here. So um, um, how do we treat coronary artery disease? How do we treat coronary artery disease? Before, a lot of people think that, okay, there's a blockage. You open the blockage. No. That is not how we start. The way we start with coronary artery disease, in terms of managing it, if you look at the picture of that plaque that is formed over there, the plaque that is 40%, 50%, full of cholesterol, 
before we get to anything, the number one thing that needs to be done is to control the risk factors that you have. Control the diabetes, control the hypertension, control the cholesterol. That is how you do those things. Through either medications or through lifestyle changes that can get you there. And I believe that powerful lifestyle changes can get you there if you start early and avoid complications that you cannot reverse. So that is the first stage of controlling the plaque formation. Why is that important? Because we know that if you do these things, the size of the plaque can shrink. So initially we thought that, okay, uh, it may remain the same. If you don't do anything, it only grows and get worse. I told, I told the patient, this is one of the conditions that doesn't stay the same. Either it's going down or it's going forward. So you need to make a decision where it's going to go to. You know, we had a recent discussion uh, uh, about a stress test that people do. And I'm going to come to that. And sometimes somebody says that, oh, I went to my doctor. They did a stress test and the stress test was okay. There's no problem. This is, this, it shows that there's no blockage in the heart. That is not... That is one of the greatest errors people get. I did a stress test and the stress test is normal. That means I don't have a blockage in my heart. That is not true. I can tell you emphatically that statement, if a doctor tells you that, that is erroneous. I can be confident about that. Because we know, even from the Scott Heart trial, we know that people who have inconclusive tests and other things, some of them had it. The only thing that a test tells you is that you don't have enough blockage in your heart as at that time. To cause you to have a problem. And people have had a stress test. And within one week they had a massive heart attack and some of them died. Why is it so? Some of these people have 40% blockage. And because they had 30% blockage, a rupture. 40% blockage is not going to give you chest pain. 40% blockage is not going to give you shortness of breath. But 40% blockage is the one that if you do not control your cholesterol, if you do not control your... your uh, 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 um, um, the other risk factors, that is the one that can potentially rupture with a thrombus on it and that will give you a heart attack. So we've talked about we've talked about the risk factors. We've talked about how to prevent it. That is con the, the, the four pillars, the four first four pillars of ID cardiovascular health as well as the risk factors that are associated with it. And now let us talk about the presentation. How do you know that potentially you may have a coronary artery disease? Let's put it this way. If you're a guy that you are in your 40s, that is how it starts. If you are a woman that is in your 50s, that is where it starts. So the big things is age. I intentionally left age out for a reason because I want to add age to this. So being in your 40s as a guy and being in your, in your, in your 50s as a woman should let you know that you have a predisposition to have a blockage in the heart. A lot of people say, oh, he was very young. No, 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 no. When it comes to coronary artery disease, it's 40. A lot of people think that it's a 70-year-old that must have a heart attack. That is not true. And I can tell you this. In my life, as an interventional cardiologist, I mean, this is my bread and butter, putting stents in people's heart, stents everywhere. That is what I do. I have come to realize that a lot of the people who see their doctors and are doing all their life, who see their doctors or who are taking into con who are doing the lifestyle changes that we said, most of them end up with heart attack. Actually, they may have a blockage and the blockage is stable. I mean, the blockage is not increasing because of what they are doing. Most of the people that come to us are people who have not taken, they throw everything out and they, 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 they think that, okay, everything is going to be okay. And all of a sudden they have problems. So, if you check these things, what I'm going to talk about, and you continue to experience them, then you need to think about possible coronary artery disease. That is CED. We're talking about CED today. So, number one is chest pain, right? If you are having chest pain, especially when you get a chest pain when you walk, and when you stop, the chest pain goes away. That is the classic presentation of a block of war, 
of a blockage, a plaque formation that is now probably 70% or more in the heart. I'm not talking about chest pain that comes in when you move around, when you raise your leg, when you raise your hand, you have chest pain. No. We're talking about chest pain generally on the left side. I'm using the word generally, but you can have chest pain even on the right, and it can still be that. But the common presentation is chest pain, especially on the left side, or what? Or in the middle of the chest. And and sometimes the chest pain can radiate to the hand. And it's associated, if it is associated with sweating and and people who take nitroglycerin, if you take nitroglycerin and it goes away, that is the big one. The typical presentation of chest pain that causes concern about whether you're having a heart attack or not, or whether you have significant blockage. Generally, we're talking about 65 to 75, 70%, let me put it that way, in your heart. So that is, a, well... That is, and if you are experiencing that, it is important you see a cardiologist to be able to help you and, and take care of you as quickly as possible. That is number one. Now let us talk about sometimes people don't have chest pain. The other one is shortness of breath. Having shortness of breath, right, is, is maybe due to the fact that you are not having enough blood supply to the what? To the muscle of the heart. And that is why you have shortness of breath. I'm not talking about shortness of breath that you get whilst you're sitting down. Uh, shortness of breath that you get whilst you're sitting down is not related most of the time to blockage in the heart. The mechanism is that when you move, that's why you need more blood supply. And so when you have shortness of breath on exertion, not shortness of breath at rest, generally that may be uh, another evidence that you may be having uh, 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 coronary artery disease that is significant and that needs to be addressed. That point that well, you need treatment as quickly as possible. The other one that I see a lot in, in men is indigestion. You'll be surprised. You see, they think that they've got indigestion. I've, 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 I've seen a lot of men come to me uh, 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 and the first time that they, they are having a heart attack, two weeks before they had a heart attack, they said they were having what? They were having indigestion. They are having indigestion. Let me put it this way. If you have an indigestion, make sure you see a gastroenterologist to take care and make sure that it is not coming from what? It is not coming from the stomach. And if they say it's not coming from the stomach, then it's important that you see a cardiologist, somebody to also examine and make sure that the indigestion, especially with women, the indigestion is not coming from a blockage. This is the reason why People can have indigestion because there's a blood vessel, we call it the RCE, right coronary artery. It lies at the bottom of the heart and that is above the stomach. And sometimes when there's a blockage in that area, people think that they are having an indigestion. And it's not an indigestion, actually they are having a heart attack. A lot of people have come to have, there's, a, there's a, an interventional cardiologist that said that I've done a lot of young men well, who, have, who came with massive heart attacks and their belly was full of tongues, right? <laughs> the reason is that they thought that was indigestion. So that is why it is important that if you're having any of these three, these are the three big ones uh, that I'll say, chest pain, shortness of breath, and uh, sometimes indigestion. These are the big three big ones that, that, that you should look at. There are many reasons for shortness of breath. In terms of, uh, and there are many reasons for chest pain. You can have chest pain from the muscle, you can have chest pain from the lungs, you can have chest pain from the heart. The one that kills you, and that one worries us most, uh, uh, is a massive heart attack that can lead to problems. The other conditions, I mean, having a clot in your lungs and all those things are things that uh, pulmonary doctors can look at. But from the coronary artery disease perspective, this is very, very important. So now, once if you are doing the lifestyle changes, and if you are doing um, 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 all the preventive measures, and at the end of the day, you ended up having coronary artery disease, your doctor told you that, uh, how do we find it out? We find it out by, sometimes we'll do a stress test. A stress test will give us an idea. Or 
uh, um, uh, the stress test, there are various types of stress tests. We'll later talk about the various type of stress tests. One day when we come here, we'll explain to you the concept of the stress test. What does a stress test mean? Uh, I mean, one of my patients means that, uh, is it, when I told the patient that you're going to have a stress test, he said, dog, there's a lot of stress in my life. I said, look, America is full of stress. That's not the one that I'm talking about, okay? So, 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 we're going to talk about something different. We're going to explain to you what a stress test stands for. And uh, that will be what I'll be dwelling on next week to, to show you the different type of stress tests and the things that are done to be able to help you. If the doctor tells you that you have a blockage in the heart and by stress test or something like that, they, I'm not talking about people who have got a heart attack. People who have got a heart attack, um, I'm going to come to that. That will be the last thing that I'll be talking about today. But people who don't have a heart attack, this, if you don't have a heart attack and yet you've got blockage in the blood vessels in your heart, Having a blockage or a plaque in your heart, which a lot of people have it, does not mean that you've got a heart attack. It just predisposes you to having a heart attack. If by the workup that your doctor did, that you have a, a blockage in the blood vessel and you don't have a heart attack, then the doctor will give you medicines. Let me go through some of the medicines and then we will end up here. The number one medicine will be aspirin. Right? The other medication that your doctor is going to give to you is the cholesterol medication. And the cholesterol medication ideally should be high doses of powerful cholesterol medications. And generally, the recommendation will be atovastatin and rosuvastatin. These are the two cholesterol medications. And then your doctor will also add other medications. Generally, a beta blocker is also going to be good. There are other things that your doctor is going to do for you, and when and 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 some of them also sometimes the doctor will do a cocardiogram, and the echocardiogram if the echocardiogram also shows that your heart has not been weakened by the blockages that you have, your doctor may put you on medications like uh, we call them ACE inhibitors or, or ARBs. These are medications that will ultimately help the heart to recover, if. After the medications, you keep on having uh, chest pain. Or if after the medication, you started the medications, you keep on having that. Then, or if you end up having evidence that the, the, you are having symptoms and the symptoms are, the chest pain is ongoing and the symptoms are not responding fully to medication. This, I'm not talking about people who have evidence of ongoing chest pain. But if, or people who are present with heart attack, if you come with a heart attack, you're going to get the medications and the doctor is going to open up the blood vessels. You can look at the picture now. That's what we do. On the one, one side, you see the blockages. On the other side, on the other side of the heart, you see that the blood vessels have been opened. Why does the doctor need to do that? This is what I do. I, I essentially do this. This occupies probably 50% of my time as a physician. And you see that the person had a blockage. The doctor will put in a stent, and that is a stent that you see over there. And the stent is going to open it up so that the medications that you are taking, they will get to the heart. I tell the patients, it is not the stent that does the work. The stent only opens what? The blockage. So, that the, so if the doctor opens up the blood vessel and you do not take the medications, then it's a moot point. Because the blood that is going through, if it doesn't got the medications, then it's not going to help the muscle. So when the doctor puts in the stent, then it is important for you to be able to what, to take the medications. So because now the door has been what has been opened. I always use the principle of a dam. If there is no water in the there is no water in the river, when you open the dam, it's a waste of time, and it's like a medication patient having a stent and not what taking his medication. So. I am, I am, we're going to end the discussion here in terms of the medications and in terms of the treatment. I'm going to come back and talk about the various type of things that we do to determine whether there's a blockage in your heart. And when we go through that, then we're going to go into a little bit of details about, about the treatment in various ways. Uh, we'll show you pictures of how sometimes these procedures are done to give you uh, a much better picture of it. But once you have 
have been established that with coronary disease, I want to encourage you to take your medications. And once you take your medications, then uh, you follow up with your doctor. And your doctor is going to make sure that you are not having any symptoms that he thinks that may be related to that. But if you are listening to me and you have chest pain when you walk, if you are listening to me, you get short of breath when you walk. And if you are having indigestion and the thumbs and the thumbs, it may be a very important idea if you are more than 50 years old or if you are more than 40 years old as a man that you take the appropriate steps to help you to ensure that there is no coronary artery disease, which doctors call CAD. Thank you for joining me today. It's been a wonderful time. I believe that uh, you're going to join me next week, even as we talk about the various tests and other things doctors can do to determine whether there may be blockage in the blood vessels or not, and, uh, and then what is done thereafter. Thank you very much. I want to thank my producer, Mr. Blay, the best, who has been helping in, in a day, in and out, to ensure that we we'll bring you this wonderful program. Um, we want you to also contact us about the uh, and give us a feedback about what we are doing and in ways that we can improve it. Let us also know about the things that you would like to hear from us. Uh, I was discussing that with my producer today because we want to make sure that at the end of the day, we are serving your needs. God bless you and God bless this great nation of ours. Thank you very much.